Good evening um, and welcome. It's a bit chilly tonight, so um, we'll shut the doors and uh, hope to keep you warm. Um, obviously, the church doesn't put its heating on yet. Um, thank you for coming. And uh, thank you, anybody who came to support our Inspire weekend last weekend. Um, it was a great success. We normally get about 450 people through St. Barb on a normal weekend. We had 1,200 which was brilliant. And um, there was some very innovative um, activities. We had the Galliard Ensemble from the Solent Festival who came and played eerie music, which was very interesting, very good. Um, before I introduce tonight's speakers, um, I just wanted to let you know about the next talk, which is on the 5th of November. So that's easy to remember. Um, and we have a talk by Philip St. Lawrence, who is an inspirational speaker. He has spoken at the Chalk Valley Literary Festival and um, various other festivals, and um, is going to talk to us about Francis Drake and the singeing of the King of Spain's beard. So he's a lively speaker, and he's assured me that it's going to be a lot of fun. So do come along to that. And then um, the last event of the year is our Christmas party, which is on the 3rd of December, so the first Friday again. And that'll be over at St. Barb. And um, it will be uh, free of charge because there haven't been many social events this year. So um, please do come along, have a glass of wine and a mince pie with us and celebrate the end of a very difficult year for everybody. But also, I think um, St. Barb has concluded the year very successfully, and uh, I think we should say thank you to the staff as well at that party. So, There's only one member of staff here. <laughs> Which leads me to introduce tonight's speakers. Um, I hope some of you have had a chance to look at the exhibition over the road. It's very thought-provoking, very interesting, and I felt it deserves several visits just to absorb the um, images and what they are saying. Um, the exhibition Unsettling Landscapes, Art of the Eerie, has been curated by our very own Steve, with some celebrity help from Jill Clark and uh, Robert McFarlane, who has written um, the introduction to the book about the exhibition, which we have on sale at the back. If you want one when you're leaving, uh, Janet in the entrance has the wherewithal to take your money from you. And um, I also just wanted to let you know that we have just published the new What's On at St. Barb, and there are some of those in the lobby as well. So if you want to know what's going on at St. Barb, pick up one of those. Um, so with that, I will hand over to Steve and Jill, who are going to talk about Erie. Good evening, everybody. Can you all hear me? Excellent. Jolly good. Well, um, welcome to the talk and thank you for coming, despite the lack of petrol and everything else. It was very good to see you all and very nice to be back here in person. The last one of these I did was by Zoom, so this is um, much more preferable. So this exhibition, Unsettling Landscapes, the Art of the Eerie, the origins of it lie in an article that Robert McFarlane wrote in The Guardian in 2015 called The Eeriness of the English Countryside. Uh, I saw that, that article and it got me thinking about this sort of vein of strange and unsettling takes on the English landscape in art. Robert was talking about sort of cinema and um, contemporary art and also literature. Um, but it struck me that in my work as a, as a curator here and other, for other museums, I'd come across lots of artwork that would fit that theme very well. And it got me, it got the brain ticking over. Uh, and a few years later, I suggested to St. Barb that maybe this might be a nice idea for an exhibition here. And they said, yes. Um, 
I went back to Robert McFarlane and said, would you like to, to be involved in some way? And he very kindly, despite how busy he is, um, got involved and adapted his writings on the subject for the catalogue, as Prue has mentioned. Um, so Robert wrote the introduction, looking at eerie, definitions of eerie and, and some of the context. And I asked my friend Jill Clark if she would like to, um, she would like to get involved, and she very gamely <laughs> came on board. So we then shared the writing of the, of the captions for the catalogue for the uh, historic works and the artists wrote about their own, the living artists wrote about their own work. And here we are, the exhibition is open just as the nights are drawing in and things are becoming a little bit eerier. So in his essay in the catalogue, um, Robert looks in to the meaning uh, of eerie. What, does it, what is it all about? So the word itself was originally thought to mean fearful, but it's come to have a much more precise definition um, around a kind of sourceless unease. So the eerie is hard to pin down. It's alarming because it's hard to pin down. It's all about aura, atmosphere, unseen presence and expectancy. Another writer on the eerie, a chap called Mark Fisher, who wrote a book called The Weird and the Eerie in 2016 said, the eerie concerns the unknown. When knowledge is achieved, the eerie disappears. And you'll see in the quote up above behind me here, um, Robert sort of talking about the eerie and distinguishing it from horror. So horror is kind of confrontational. The eerie is much more about intimation. It's things around the edges. Uh, it's the opposite of the kind of pastoral tradition, that sort of reassuring, homely, cosy views of the countryside that we see in a lot of British art, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but this is the flip side of the coin. And Rob also talks about the way in which the eerie has tended to bubble up in, in our cultural life in times of trouble. So in this exhibition, we see it in artist work in the aftermath of the First World War. We see it um, amongst the work of the Neoromantics around the Second World War, which Jill will be, will be talking about in, in a moment. Um, the 1970s seem to have been a particularly eerie decade. The kind of breakdown of the post-war consensus, that social upheaval and dislocation that we saw seem to add very much to that mix. And today, it's the world, it's sort of, it's climate change, the climate crisis, it's the problems that we have around our impact on nature, which is giving artists fuel for their eerie artworks in these difficult times. So the exhibition is divided into four themes, and we're going to talk about each of those themes tonight with illustrations of a few of the works um, that apply. So the first theme we're looking at is around absence and presence. So the strange atmospheres conjured by the unexpected appearance or absence of the human figure. And there are also, there's an uncanny intensity that's seen to radiate from inanimate objects. And of course, the idea of animism, this, this thought that we can attribute sentience and purpose to lifeless objects plays its part in the eerie as well. Mark Fisher, again, when he was discussing the idea of the eerie, talked about agency as being a key element. This idea that something usually that we can't see is affecting our experiences and is giving us that unsettling feeling that we associate with eeriness. And the last element in this really is the incongruous. So objects, um, that, that, that appear out of place or out of time. So the fact that they are present, the fact that we can see them gives us a, um, a little bit of a of pause for thought. Uh, at this point, I hand over to Jill to talk about the first pictures. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. And it's lovely to be back um, working with Steve. As many as you will know, I've had the privilege to work with Steve for a long time. In fact, it goes back now to 2006 when we did the Evelyn Dunbar uh, exhibition. So, um, but that wasn't eerie. This is eerie. And this for me also has been a journey and has actually taken me out of my comfort zone. And it's made me ask questions about the art and look at it in different ways. So I think Prue is absolutely right about the ex ex exhibition warranting more than one look. It, it's about looking and it's about looking again about what is there and what is not there. So I've tried to do that when I've looked at these artworks. So the first artwork that you've got in front of you, as some of you will already know, it's the cover of the, uh, the book. 
and it was one that Steve and I were, I think I can say we were pretty unanimous, weren't we, in wanting it as the cover because it really is a striking image. It was painted by uh, Tristan Hillier. It was one of the last works that he actually did. He was 75 when he painted this, but he was still going strong, meticulous uh, artist. His family knew not to disturb him when he was painting. He was there and he was working. And you can see that some of that coming through. But it was painted very close to where he lived in, in Somerset. It was an area that he knew well. He'd grown up there. He'd gone to school at Downside Abbey where he was taught by Benedictine monks. And, and I mention the context, and I'll do that with some of the paintings because I think it's important in terms of understanding some of the paintings. It's also about understanding some of the artists and where they're actually coming from and what's impacted on them. Um, so he was attracted to the isolation of the area. And I think you'll see in that painting, there is an eerie sense of stillness. It's unnaturally quiet. There are no people there. But yet the signs of somebody or something has been there. You can see that discarded red jumper. Now, who does that belong to? Why is it discarded? And you can see signs, again, of human activity, but there's nothing there. You've got the broken gates, you can see, in the background. Um, there's a discarded spade just in front of that jumper. So it feels like something is about to happen, but we don't know what it is. Uh, and those pollarded willow trees at the front that you can see, they look like clenched fists. And they're leaning over in a sort of threatening, um, they dominate the landscape. It's unexplained. So it really, the symbolism is, it's subtle. And that's what Hillier was looking to do in his artwork. He didn't want to create a nightmare, but he wanted to unsettle. And I think you probably agree that he achieves that. So moving on, and, and I've got four more paintings, and then I move back to, to Steve. So we'll take it um, right. So um, this is painted much earlier than the previous work. This is painted in 1945, so towards the end of the Second World War. It was painted by Keith Vaughan, and Steve mentioned about neo-romantic artists, and this is one of a number of artworks that you'll see that are in uh, that vein. When he painted this, he was working in a, a prisoner of war camp in Moulton in Yorkshire. And like other artists during the war, there was a limit to materials that were available. And also, it was difficult for him to get subject uh, matter to actually paint. So he was limited to where he could get to from the camp by bus and then get back again. So um, he clearly took a bus to find this um, deserted uh, schoolhouse. And again, you'll get a feeling with these of, of, again, what is going on? And so he conveys a sense here that something is about to happen. You can see the schoolboys as, as you look at it. There's two of them look like they're embroiled in a fight. They're in drab gray uniform. There's another lad in the foreground. But what is he doing? Where is he going? And that schoolhouse, when you look at it, it, it looks deserted. And the windows look broken. And the muted palette that Vaughan uses conveys a sense of, of something, of drama, of something is about to happen. And what he also does with his painting, where you can see some of the brighter bits, he uses a form of wax resist. So when the paint is applied, it doesn't actually take in the same way. And he'd learned that from Graham Sutherland, whose work we'll see later on. Um, and he would visit him in, in Kent. So he had no studio to do this. So he would have had to paint this in the barracks when he'd finished doing his duties as an orderly or as um, an interpreter for some of the German prisoners. So the next work I'm going to show is, is again, it's another artwork in the, the neo-romantic vein. This is by um, John Minton, painted in 1944. So 
penultimate year of the war. But the year again is quite important and the context is relevant in that John Minton was, he applied to be a conscientious objector, but when he applied, that was rejected. So he was later called up, in 1941 he was called up and he joined the Pioneer Corps. And he served for two years until 1943 when he was discharged on the grounds of ill health. But uh, what people believe is that it was also on the grounds of him being homosexual. So here we have a young man who's been discharged from the army. He is wrestling with his identity as well. And when you look at that painting, it's a frenetic painting. It's absolutely full of stuff, if you like. The, the, the vegetation, it's sort of, um, it's writhing. And if you look carefully under the tree, you can see there's a classically draped figure. Can you spot that? Yeah. It's probably one of the ones that I think, dare I say it, reproduced least well. Um, it's still good, but you have to come, if you haven't been to the gallery, to see it because it's... It's striking. Um, but that figure is there, and I refer to them. I, I say he, she, they're androgynous. You really can't tell whether they're male or female, but they're classically draped. And there is some suggestion that you know, this is very much reflecting the tensions that Minton was wrestling with. And, and indeed, he took his own life later when he felt he was he was out of touch with the sort of move towards abstraction. But he was an admirer of Samuel Palmer, like many of the artists you'll see. But this certainly, it's not a bucolic sort of painting. It's no pastoral um, idyll. And again, we've got those sombre tones like we have saw in the, the previous work. And the next slide that I'm going to show you, Steve mentioned about the 70s. So this is um, Carol Waite and... I wasn't really sure about this painting when I was writing about it, or indeed about some of his work, but actually when you see it in the gallery, the lighting is absolutely stunning. You can see that bit where there's an old man, he's just towards the back of the composition, he's just disappearing round the lane, but that lighting is fantastic. And but Waite's work was actually inspired and founded by his childhood. He had a very disturbed childhood. He was actually fostered during the week and only allowed to come home at weekends. He didn't even have a room when he came back to his family home. The, the um, maid had a room, but he had no room. So he, his, his childhood, and indeed his adult, was not a adulthood was not a comfortable time to him. But he likened his painting to the Victorian novelist Charles Dickens, who liked to um, set up his story, establish his characters, and let them almost have a life of his own. And that's what happens in his, his paintings, the way he establishes and creates a story. But there is a real feeling of intensity in, in the painting. And you wonder, there's a sense of mystery. What's happened? Is something, did something happen when those people passed? Or is something about to happen when they go round the corner? And there's a sense of drama across the whole painting. Now, the next one I'm going to show you is by the acclaimed photographer Faye uh, Faye Godwin, who actually took up painting in, sorry, took up photography uh, in her 30s. And it was actually because of taking family snaps. And that developed into um, the skills that she developed because she was largely self-taught. And this is typical of her work, the, the st stark simplicity of it. And again, it, it's sombre, but it's unsentimental. But what she was so skilled at was leaving much to the imagination. And we can all, in many ways, look at almost any of these paintings, and we may choose to read them differently. Different things will, will speak to us. But she was very concerned with the changing landscape, and she was um, a campaigning member of the, the Ramblers Association. In fact, she was their president for a long time. So she was concerned 
about the marks made on the landscape and the marks that are left behind. And here you have a mark that was left behind in the 1940s when the fear was that with France having fallen, England and British Isles would be uh, invaded. So hence the pillbox was built there. And you can see the, the loopholes there, as I understand that they're called, where the, the rifles or machine guns would point through. And they look like eyes. And you can imagine if you were walking by, seeing that in the sort of half light, what sort of images, the feelings that might um, cause. So she would wait for the right light and was painstaking in coming back to a site until she got the effect that she wanted. And I will now pass you to Steve, who's going to talk you through a few more paintings from our absence presence. Thank you. Thanks, Jill. Right, continuing our theme of, of absence and presence is a painting by John Piper, it's called Portland Foreshore and was painted in 1948. This, this one has come from Southampton City Art Gallery. Uh, John Piper discovered Portland shortly after the Second World War and he felt that crossing the causeway onto the aisle there was to enter another world. And of course what he found there was the abandoned stone quarries. So this picture gives us a sense of that, that emptiness with the people gone, um, all that's left of the, uh, the uh, the, you know, the ruined, partially ruined buildings, the blocks of cut stone still lying around but unused, no one coming to collect them, no one to ship them to London to build new bridges or buildings or pavements or whatever they were to be used for. And it really comes across as being something of a, of a sort of bleak, lunar, almost sort of post-apocalyptic landscape. And added to that is, is Piper's sort of predilection for dark skies, what he called the lowering clouds that belong to romantic painting. So he was harking back to the work of Turner and, uh, and others and the idea that storms and darkness create drama in your pictures. Now before, a few years before he did this, during the Second World War, one of his commissions was to paint Windsor Castle. And he worked there during one stormy summer and the skies, the, the dark skies of this stormy time were very much a feature of those works. And King George VI famously said to him, you seem to have very bad luck with your weather, Mr. Piper. <laughs> but, but it was something that he used again and again in his pictures, in his landscapes, his architectural studies. You see these, these dark, dark skies set in the buildings, set against them, and it does give them this air of eeriness. Now we're coming right up to the present here. This is a drawing by Stanley Donwood. It's called Hanging Hill and was made earlier this year. Now Stanley has collaborated with Robert McFarlane on a couple of books. He's illustrated Holloway and Ness. Some of you may well have read those. Um, but he's also well known as the artist responsible for the album covers for Radiohead, the rock band, and been working with them since their, the Benz album in 1995. So, We've got three works by Stanley in the exhibition, and this one I've included in the talk tonight because it really reminds me of a story by M.R. James, which Robert McFarlane quotes in his introductory essay to the catalogue. Uh, it's a story called A View from a Hill, and, and, and McFarlane really sees this as being a landmark, eerie text. The story revolves around a magically altered pair of binoculars. So when the, the central character lifts these binoculars to his eyes, instead of seeing a, a wooded hillside in front of him, he sees a gibbet with a body hanging from it. And on a, with a little bit more research, he discovers that the place he's looking at is called Gallows Hill. And he goes up there to investigate, and he feels while he's walking around on the hill that he's being followed and that he's being watched. And he actually beats a hasty retreat because he feels very, very uncomfortable with this feeling of presence all around him. And it turns out that the binoculars are being created by a local antiquarian, and he had boiled up the bones of people who had been hung on, and, gall and, and buried on Gallows Hill. And the, the resulting mixture he put into the binoculars so that when you look through it, you could see into the past. So kind of occult antiquarianism going on here, which is very M.R. James. Um, 
And it, it turns out that actually that this, this man who made the binoculars had his comeuppance because the people from Gallows Hill came down, the ones who'd, been, who'd died and been hung there and buried there, come down from the hill and they take him away and his body is found a few days later lying on the top of the hill with a broken neck. You can, uh, you can get that sense of it. So this, the idea of this sort of sense of presence of watchfulness and also that the effects of past horrors leave a mark on the landscape. So um, terrible happenings or strong emotion can leave this, this idea of kind of residual haunting on a place and present a danger potentially to those who are willing to go in and disturb the ghosts of history. Right, another contemporary work here. Um, this is by George Shaw. George is uh, a former Turner Prize nominee. He was artist in residence at the National Gallery a few years ago and was brought up uh, in Coventry. He, he sort of grew up on one of the estates on the edge of Coventry, so those streets and the edge lands around the city there was very much his his land when he was growing up as a child and as an adolescent. And in his work, he tends to revisit those places. And almost all of George's paintings, I can't think of any that are populated. There might be some work that he is in, but mostly there are no people in them. So that's our absence, if you like, in this picture. And this one is called The Danger of Death. And there are a couple of things that he was thinking about when he painted this. One is Lurking down at the end of the lane there is the electricity substation. And that's, if you like, that is our presence in this picture. It, it sort of, it just, it lurks there, but it quietly dominates the scene and there are lights on inside. What's going on down there? Uh, and George talks about, or he writes about this in the catalogue. He says the two things that he was thinking of here, one is the power cuts of the 1970s, the winter of discontent, the three day week, all of that stuff that I'm sure a few of you here will remember. Um, and of course he found himself as a, as, as a child, as a boy, growing up in, in this house, suddenly there's no electricity, then the evenings they're lit with candles and he felt that he'd been sent back, if you like, to um, a more distant, older and mysterious world. So this substation really had been failing in its duty to keep his keep his house lit, he felt. Uh, and also the idea of the danger of death looks back to those public information films. I don't know if any of you remember seeing um, those films in the 1960s, 1970s, things that told you that it wasn't a good idea to go and fly your kite under an electricity pylon. Um, don't play in the substation, don't play by deep water. And that particular one, you've got the Grim Reaper standing in the background behind the children. And these terrified a generation of kids when they were growing up, and George being one of them. So so the danger of death is the signs on the substation outside, but it's also thinking of some of these films that were meant to help us, but actually frighten the life out of us at the time. Uh, and he also suggests that that, that, that sort of that warning, that danger of death is in, in a way is quite appealing. There's an excitement around the idea of danger. And he talks about being pied pipered into your doom, if you like, by going further into the substation. Again, no people, but maybe evidence that they've been around. There's a couple of bits of fly tipping that have gone on on the lane there as well. Right, so that's the end of our, the first of our four themes. And we now move on to ancient landscapes. So why are ancient landscapes eerie or why can they be eerie in the hands of artists or perhaps to us in the right weather conditions? Well, the, the mysteries around the purposes of monuments like Stonehenge and Avebury have given rise to all kinds of legends and romantic stories. And despite all the archeological work that's gone on over the years, we still don't really know what went on there. We don't know the exact purpose of these places. We know they're kind of ritual sites. Um, people believe they were used for the veneration of the dead, but exactly what rituals happened there and what they were for, we, we don't know. It's lost to us. So that, the fact that we don't know what these places are leaves them with a kind of an unsettling presence and a mystique that lives on to this day. Places like barrows and burial chambers also that relate to the, you know, the interment and the veneration of the dead. And they also tend to be usually in quite remote places. So they, have a, a, um, they, they lend themselves to eerie treatments. And again, we come back to this idea of animism, the thought that we might doubt whether inanimate objects are actually alive. Do the stones embody the spirits of the ancient dead? Freud would tell us um, that the return of primitive beliefs like animism um, that we've previously repressed tend to result in feelings of the uncanny. There we go. 
Right. So we've got a couple of photographs to start with here. The one on the left-hand side uh, was taken by Paul Nash at Avebury in 1933. The one on the right-hand side was taken by John Piper. Um, we don't know exactly when it's undated, but he probably made it while he was preparing a shell guide to Oxfordshire, and it shows some of the Rollwright stones. So when Nash went to Avebury in the 1930s, it was before the site had been restored. So he found that the stones, some of them were overturned, some of them were buried in the undergrowth, but he talks about them being wonderful and disquieting. But he, at the time, he attributed that kind of imposing presence that we see in his portrait of this Avebury Sentinel um, to the spirit of the stone itself. It wasn't about some, something around ancestor worship or anything like that. It was the stone that had that presence, that personality, if you like. John Piper, when he came to the Rollwrights, um, he, he would have discovered the legend that had built up around them. In the absence of, of, of fact, in the absence of history, people made up stories about these things. They'd been in the landscape for thousands of years. And the ideas behind the Rollwright stone, if you believe the local legends, are that there's a, a single stone known as the King Stone. And he was actually a king who was tricked by a witch and turned to stone. His men, which is a nearby stone circle, um, were also petrified by the witch. And then this little group, which is actually the remains of a burial chamber, Chamber, are known as the Whispering Knights. And the idea is that they are a group of conspirators who were plotting against the king. And you can see them there, still huddled in their, in their sort of secret conference. And the way both of these artists, you know, they, they've both got an eye for composition. They've tightly framed the both of them so that the objects really seem to loom um, and to, to fill up the, the, uh, the, the composition, as it were. And I think in the in the sense of the Piper one, I love the fact that he's included this railing that's being put around them. Um, obviously, originally installed to keep us off, but there is this just thought there. It's like um, going to the zoo. If they actually put the railing up to keep the stones in. <laughs> so Paul Nash, when he was given a camera, it kind of opened up a new world to him. His wife gave him a camera in 1931. By this time, he was really struggling with asthma and he couldn't stay outside very long to sketch. So having, having this, this gadget where he could go out now and capture things in the landscape very quickly and then take them away with him to build into his pictures um, was a really, really, really useful scheme. He didn't see photography as an art form in its own right necessarily, but it did inform his paintings. And painting allowed his imagination to run free. So what he tended to do was take some of the, the objects that he'd seen when he was out on his travels and then amalgamate them into his paintings. This one is called Landscape of the Megaliths. It dates from 1934, so a year after he took that photograph at Avebury. And it, in, it includes two Avebury stones in the foreground. But beyond, in the background, we can see the Whittenham clumps. Now, the Whittenham clumps are in Berkshire, nowhere near Avebury. But these are two of Nash's favourite places. He collected places and was very keen on the idea of spirit of place, the fact that a, a place can have its own um, atmosphere, personality, if you like. And at the time he was making this picture, he was particularly interested in new ideas in the art world around surrealism and abstraction. But what he wanted to do somehow was to combine that with his love of the English landscape. And his answer to this conundrum was to take things that he had seen in different places and then bring them together in these kind of slightly dreamlike surreal compositions. So you have the Avebury stones and the Whitnam clumps in the background, two of his favorite places rolled into one. Now, Henry Moore, you probably know him best as a, as a sculptor, but he's also a very fine draftsman and a printmaker. He first went to, to Stonehenge in 1921 when he was a student at the Royal College of Art. And he arrived in Salisbury late in the day, but wanted to go straight to Stonehenge to see it. So when he got there, it was nighttime, and he actually saw the stones for that first time by moonlight. And he said that for many, many years afterwards, that was his idea of Stonehenge. And you can imagine they would have, they would have appeared very imposing and strange and eerie in the moonlight. 50 years later, he produced this series of prints of which this is one. Um, this is called Hacked Stone, and it's uh, the fifth in the series of uh, sort of lithographs and relief prints that he made at the time, sorry, intaglio prints that he made at the time. Stephen Spender, writing in the catalogue for, for these uh, prints, described them as having a feeling of the inhuman and terrifying. 
The stones kind of, they loom up and blot out the landscape. There's one right in front of us there and another one lurking just behind. And they're very dark and they're, they're sort of hiding the view of everything else. This one with its title hacked stone refers to the surface of the stone itself. Um, and do those marks, do those marks on, on its surface relate us back to the, the makers of Stonehenge and their mysterious purposes? Is it weathering? We don't know, but there's certainly a, a sense of there's something um, intimidating and uncanny in this view. Paul Drury was a friend of Graham Sutherland's and he learned etching at Goldsmiths College alongside Sutherland, um, both of them working initially in a Samuel Palmer inspired pastoral style. Um, Drury went on to become the head of the etching department at Goldsmiths and when this picture was made in 1963 he was still teaching there and also teaching a summer school near Avebury and he took his students to, to the area to do sketching and made three prints of his own while he was there. This is the strangest, this is an eerie exhibition, so of course we've picked the strangest and most unsettling of the three. It's called Ancient Landscape One, and there's this sense of sort of time being out of joint. Now, I don't have a great grasp of prehistory, but I know there weren't pterodactyls flying around when Avebury was built. So there, there's something not quite right here. We've got two different timescales in the same picture. And what he's done, he's taken one of the standing stones from Avebury and he's cut a hole in the bottom of it, but the hole is actually in the shape of a skull. I don't know if you can see the eye socket on the left-hand side there and the, the brow above and then the, 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 the dome of the skull going back behind it. And through that skull-shaped um, cavity, we can see the setting sun uh, and a, a ring of stones. So whether this is um, Drury thinking about mortality, the, the skull is usually a symbol of mortality, um, we're not quite sure. It's quite possible that at the time that he made this, Goldsmith was going through a process of modernization and maybe he had some concerns about his professional future and his life at that time. His son has pointed out that in the surface of the stone, it's possible maybe to pick out creatures in the surface. And he thinks that there is a phoenix there, just a, right in the centre of the stone, just above the skull there. And if that's the case, then we've got the skull symbolising mortality, but we've got the phoenix um, symbolising new life and regeneration. I'm now going to hand back to Jill. Thank you. So there's, there's two paintings that I want to talk about now. So this follows on rather well from that. This is um, by Ithel Cahoon, who was not only an artist, but also a writer and very much involved with the occult. And she did this in 1957. She trained actually at, at the Slade School of Art under Randall Schwab and Henry Tonks just before he retired. So this was done some years after she'd left. And it was actually one of 20 drawings that she did in 1957 for a book that she wrote actually called The Living Stones Cornwall. And it was a sort of travelogue that she wrote. She, she'd also done one, a previous one. And it's a semi-autobiographical text about the places that uh, she visited. So this was set in the uh, landscape around um, not far from where she was staying in La Morna. She'd bought um, or rented and then bought a remote cottage to partly to escape her rather complex life in, in London. She'd been involved at one time with the Surrealist movement, but had, had fallen out with uh, that group. So she would come to Cornwall because she was attracted by, like other artists, by the light and the atmosphere of Cornwall. But also she was attracted by the folklore and the mythology and the legends. And she was particularly interested in these megalithic standing stones. And as you can see, there's three of them. And I was doing a little bit further reading, and someone talks about them actually making up 101. And when you look at them, and I hadn't actually picked that up before, but it looks like the number 101 sort of written there. But the central whole is significant in the same way as Steve was talking about the, the Drury painting. And legend had it that if children had rickets, if you pass them through the middle of that stone, 
it would cure their rickets. Uh, she also discovered that it was supposed to cure rheumatism. And so she, cure, she, it, she got through the stone herself, but was very disappointed to find out that it wasn't actually effective because she then learned that you were supposed to do that in a state of nudity. <laughs> so um, anyway, it, so she saw these stones as being repositories for uh, ancient powers, and you can see them. They're stood there in, in West Penwith in this barren windscape, uh, windswept landscape. So um, the next work that I want to show you is done. We're back in the Second World War. We're going back now to 1941, and this is by John Craxton, and it's the ruins of Knowlton Church, which are on the edge of the Cranbourne Chase uh, in Dorset. And these ruins also caught the attention of John Piper. And in the exhibition, we have a, a photograph by Piper. And clearly tonight, we're only giving you a selection. There's, there's many more works that are worth coming uh, to see. So Craxton was familiar with the area. He'd stayed there as a child and he remembered this church and he saw it very much as um, like something from a set from one of the ghost stories that M.R. James wrote and, and Steve's already mentioned one of the, the stories earlier. So he was only 19 or thereabouts when he, he painted this and he'd wanted to be a painter from a young age. But at 16, he was deemed too young to go to Chelsea School of Art, too impressionable to go to life classes. So he wasn't allowed to go. So he went to Paris to study where he met other artists who painted in a neo-romantic way, which you can see that in this uh, composition. So. After the war, he, he did come back and there was a small period of study at Goldsmiths where he was encouraged by uh, Graham Sutherland in his work. And you can see the influence of Sutherland in this. But he was rejected for military service because as a schoolboy, he had had pleurisy. So he was able to carry on uh, working. But it's a heavily worked drawing and you can see in the foreground that the, uh, the creepers that are coming up around the side of the church, again, they're writhing, they're menacing. You wonder what um, they might almost turn into. It's a highly charged scene, and perhaps it reflects something of the tensions of the early years of the war. But again, Steve mentioned about um, the landscape and the stones being it's, it's, almost sentient beings, and you, you feel that there with these creepers, that they are imbued with a sense of human agency, and they might metamorphose into some kind of predatory animal. So I'll pass Steve back, because I think you will now introduce the next section. Almost. Almost. <laughs> After you've spoken. Hey-ho. Thanks, Jill. Uh, yeah, just, uh, just a couple short more ones on this uh, sort of ancient landscape section. This is a piece of artwork from the Ghost Box record label. We've got three pieces of their, um, their art in the exhibition. And they describe themselves as a record label for a group of artists exploring the misremembered musical history of a parallel world. And their artwork uh, by Julian House and there's the sounds which are sort of part radiophonic workshop, part public information film, part something quite different, um, sort of evokes a slightly strange and alternative 1960s and 70s theme through the prism of something quite unusual. For this album, this is actually a spoken word album based on the writings of Justin Hopper uh, with sort of incidental music by Sharon Krauss and Belbury Polly. And Justin Hopper says, if there is a thin place on my personal map, it is Shanktonbury, where a glimpse of another world peeks through. This idea of thin places where um, denizens of the other world, this goes back to kind of pre-Christian pre Celtic mythology and Celtic worldview, um, the idea that these things can, there are places where things are thin, the boundaries are thin and they can make their way through into our world and vice versa. And that's what he's referring to here. Um, and when he traveled there, he, he thought that he'd seen the ghost of his grandma, 
grandmother who he used to go walking with in that area. And Robert McFarlane in another book tells the story of when he rather bravely decided to spend the night on Shanktonbury Rings and was awoken by screaming sounds, sounding like human screaming, coming from the tops of the trees around him. They're two different places and they gradually moved around the ring until they were right overhead. And then after a few minutes, the sound gradually disappeared. But um, he did think he had been rather rash in deciding to spend the night there. Um, and you can see, though, in the, in the artwork that they've created here, there's that sense of um, sort of slightly intimidating, slightly threatening, not very welcoming place to follow the path up towards. You think that something strange might happen there. Thank you. <laughs> I was wondering where that had gone. Um, Right, the last one in this section, we're back to M.R. James here. This is an etching by Francis Mosley, which was created for a Folio Society edition of the collected ghost stories of M.R. James. It relates to a story called A Warning to the Curious. Um, and it's really a cautionary tale about the perils of treasure hunting. Somebody finds a clue as to where an Anglo-Saxon crown has been buried and decides he will go and dig it up. But the crown has been buried there to help protect England from invasion. And what he doesn't know is that a family had been given the duty of, of protecting the crown and they had all died, but that didn't necessarily stop them from carrying, continuing to carry out their duties. So he feels that wherever he goes, he's being followed. There's a presence at the end of the corridor around the corner. So he decides he must go and put the crown back. And he goes with a couple of colleagues, um, which is work they're doing here and you've got that sense of kind of expectancy and, and um, slight threat here. Sadly for the thief, um, this does not placate the ghostly um, guardian and he comes to a fairly grisly end at the end of the story so uh, that's one to check out. Right, the third of our four themes tonight is unquiet nature. Simon Sharma in his book Landscape and Memory says there have always been two kinds of Arcadia, shaggy and smooth dark and light, a place of bucolic leisure, and a place of primitive panic. You can guess which one we're leaning towards with our eerie exhibition tonight. Um, maybe these are folk memories of the wild woods, a sort of um, the, the antithesis of civilization in Roman times, um, and that, that perhaps still come back to haunt us. There's also the idea that humans project their troubles onto the environment around them. Um, so nature, the near romantics that Jill has been looking at, they took Samuel Palmer's vision, this sort of vision of paradise on earth painted in the 1820s and 1830s, and under the threat and the shadow of war, they twisted it into something dark and menacing. The looming presence of trees has a particularly unsettling power and appears in a number of these works. And the other element of it is those empty tracts of lands, heathland, um, that um, back in the Anglo-Saxon times they felt might be the home to dreadful monsters like Grendel. Um, it's Shakespeare's blasted heath, it's Thomas Hardy's Egdon, which was watchful and, um, and just waiting for something dramatic to happen. So I'm now going to hand over to Jill. Thank you. So... I'm going to talk about a couple of, of Sutherland paintings and then um, three other works. So this is called Pastoral, painted in 1930. And it was actually Sutherland's only etching that he did in 1930 because the market for etchings absolutely collapsed. So artists need to, to find other ways of working, other ways of, of generating income. But it is, it's an important work for a number of reasons because not only does it show the influence of Stanley Palmer as, um, as Samuel Palmer as Steve mentioned but more than that it actually shows a turning point in Sutherland's work and how he looked at nature and how he represented it and to the title pastoral you can see it is anything but pastoral so it is it's it's a somewhat ironic sort of reference to the notion of pastoral and the work that, that Palmer did, because at this time he felt that his work was actually to cul-de-sac, that it was going nowhere and that he needed to um, develop his work. But it's full of drama. There's a sort of brooding, malevolent intent located within the work and he attributes animistic qualities to the trees to the way that they move and particularly that hollowed oak that you can see 
and the way it looks as if it's going to lean over and swallow those two um, leafless trees, those bleached ones that look rather like sort of tentacles. But the shadows as well, they're disconcerting. There's a sense of decay. And Steve made the point also about um, the background to it and how artists perhaps were transposing their, their feelings into the works that they were engaged in for various reasons. But for Sutherland or for the Sutherlands, they had lost their only child the previous year. Um, the child was barely three months old. So it's possible that some of his grief is translated through some of these images. Now, as you'll see, pastoral, it foreshadows some of his later work. Um, so now it's a much more um, distinctive style. It's a much more abstract. And this green lane was painted in 1945, so pretty much towards the end of the Second World War. But it was a number of paintings that he did of um, Lane, and one of the first ones he actually did was painted in 1939. That one is in the Tate called Entrance to a Lane. Pallant House has a work, the University of Chichester has a work. So there's a number of these works that he did around um, these lanes. And these were inspired by his work, his walks in West Pembrokeshire. And he would walk within the landscape, soaking up those feelings. And then he would translate it into his work. He didn't work on plein air. He, he would go back and work these um, feelings up into his canvases. And he would take the essence of the place and then uh, translate that. So you can see how he simplifies the foliage and the topography. And there's just a few abstracted, tangled forms. And it's one of his sort of early-ish um, neo-romantic works. And you can see the sickle-shaped curves there that are um, enveloping that winding lane, which is shrouded in some almost ethereal sort of sunlight. And it disappears, but it's no scenic view. There is a sense of, again, of unease of what might emerge from that lane. And the next work is by Michael Ayrton. This too is painted uh, in the same year, 1945. And Michael Ayrton was prolific artist, very versatile. He was also later a sculptor. Um, but he tended to work in themes. And this was part of a series which focused on trees and the landscape, again, in a neo-romantic vein. And it shows the influence of Sutherland, who encouraged him. And Ayrton was a great admirer of Sutherland. But Ayrton, and you can probably get a sense of this, was fascinated by tree roots. And the, the gnarled tree trunks that he, he puts in the painting here. And like Nash, his trees take on a menacing, sentient sort of presence. There's a restlessness to it. That spiky fallen tree, to me, it looked rather like a horned animal, uh, as if it was about to pounce. But again, it's no bucolic scene. It is, as this theme very much says, it's about unquiet nature. The next work is another neo-romantic uh, work. It's by um, John Craxton, painted two years earlier in, in 1943, so the middle part of the war. And again, you can see something of the influence of Sutherland. And he knew Sutherland. They'd spent time together sketching in Pembrokeshire. And Craxton felt that he learned a lot from Sutherland, and it was Sutherland who taught him how to simplify his work and how to extract from the scene. And he felt that Sutherland taught him how to invent, almost rather like Picasso, but for Craxton, that was too limiting. That wasn't the style that later he wanted um, to adopt. But Craxton was moved by this prehistoric landscape of West Pembrokeshire. And he synthesizes the, the natural forms. And you can see how he reinvents them to convey a sense of mystery in this unsettled landscape, which 
there's a feeling of movement, a feeling that it's rising up as if it's been disturbed. And for Craxton, he saw these paintings as a means of escape. For him, it was a place of refuge. And perhaps, again, that's about wartime. It's about escape. And for him, it was his own private, mysterious world. And I'll pass you to Steve now. This is a contemporary work by Blaise Sion. It's called Croft Castle. Uh, and is a, a, if you come and see the exhibition firsthand, it's an incredible feat of drawing in uh, charcoal and Comte. Uh, really well worth investigating firsthand if you get the chance. But it's really just in here today for this, this sense of trees, you know, this looming presence. This looks like a sort of a, almost like a ghostly presence that's appeared against the darkness of the trees beyond. And a really stunning um, summary of, a, of an ancient tree, an old chestnut found near Croft Castle. Uh, Paul Nash, back to Paul Nash and his cameras again here. Um, this is called Monster Field. It was a photograph he took in 1938. He discovered Monster Field in Gloucestershire near the, the home of some friends. Two trees that had been felled in a thunderstorm and where their bark had fallen away, he described them as being bleached to a ghastly pallor and went on to say, horizontally they had assumed or acquired the personality of monsters. These inanimate natural objects are alive in quite another world, but instead of being invisible like so many of that huge community, or only made visible by the complicated machinery of spiritualism, they are so much with us that I was able to photograph them in full sunlight. But he does say in his, in his writings on Monster Field that he didn't really like to stay in the field once the sun started to go down, because he did find them rather strange and disquieting. These trees then went on, like the stones we saw earlier, appearing into his paintings, um, usually as a symbol of death or mortality. Uh, after the First World War, Nash very much associated fallen trees and even piles of logs with the dead from the First World War that he witnessed on the Western Front. Edward Burrow, his biographer, Jane Stevenson, said that being disquieting was part of his mission in life. Now, Burrow suffered an illness as a teenager which left him without energy and often in pain. And for him, art, as Jill was saying for Craxton, art was his escape. Um, it took him out of himself. What he's probably usually associated with is the, the, the paintings that he made um, of the life he saw in the bars of New York and Marseille and Paris. He had a real kind of... Um, the, the seedier side of life had a real allure to him. But all of his paintings have this sort of sense of menace to them. There are sinister undercurrents or overtones at work. Uh, but he was also always interested in landscape. And during the 1970s, just before the end of his life, he would get his sister to drive him to remote spots and they would park up on the side of the road. And there he would sit and absorb. Uh, he never sketched, like Jill was saying with Sutherland, he wasn't making sketches when he was out and about, he just looked, took it all in, and then when he got back home to his studio in Rye in Sussex, he would work these impressions into paintings. I mentioned just a little bit earlier about the idea of Heathland being sort of menacing, and really here, this is called Near Whitby, and it's probably the most bleak and empty of all of his late landscapes. Robert McFarlane has mentioned that those way markers on either side of the road appear almost like tombstones, and there's this sense that, uh, you know, would you want to carry on in your car into that intimidating blankness beyond, despite the sunshine in the valley? Is there something um, almost unnatural about that lack of life and that openness? Monica Poole um, was a wood engraver influenced by Graham Sutherland and the neo-romantics. She drew out the inherently strange beauty of trees, plants, rocks and shells. And she said that there are so many fascinating forms in the natural world which are overlooked because they occur in objects that are normally not considered attractive. She wasn't necessarily drawn to things that look beautiful. She was drawn to things that look strange um, and that definitely is a feature of her work. This one focuses on that strange world um, of the foreshore in between the sea and the land where it's not, not quite one or the other and we can see here some driftwood that's been stripped of its bark and bleached and it almost looks like the, you know, the remains of some ancient mariner washed up on the beach. 
and there's a real surreal um, dream-like mood. There's a sense of a moment frozen in time and a, an eerie stillness that might be shattered by that strange shape approaching on the horizon. Okay, we're on to the last of our themes now. Um, this is called The Dying of the Light and it's all about atmospheric effect. So the way in which the time of day, the weather, season and effects of light can create eerie atmospheres and affect the way that we experience and react to landscape. Edmund Burke, who's mentioned in the quote behind me here, his theory of the sublime written in the mid 18th century was really about saying that it was okay to make art that was about terrifying nature. And it was okay to look at that sort of art as long as you weren't actually in any real danger. So you could look at a precipitous mountainside um, as long as you weren't gonna fall off it, or you could look at a shipwreck and as long as you weren't getting wet, it was okay. Um, but one of the things that Bur Burke talks about is what he called uh, obscurity. And by obscurity, he means darkness and the fact that darkness um, lends something to, to, to pictures and, and lends some uncertainty to a scene and to our day-to-day -day experiences. So darkness plays its part in eerie landscapes, as do the, the bare trees of winter and the drab colours of winter. But even sunlight and artificial light can't necessarily banish the eerie for good, as we'll see in a few moments. I'm going to hand back to Jill. So you'll see quite a lot of darkness now. So um, this is um, Alan Reynolds. Some of you may remember we actually brought it for the Seasons exhibition. It was such a good work and so appropriate for this that we needed to bring it back. So um, it's an early work by Alan Reynolds, and it shows his interest in shape and landscape and particularly fields and hills. It's called Bleak November. And he grew up in the flat countryside in Suffolk of actually Constable. But this uh, painting is much more uh, about the, the landscape of Samuel Palmer, of the hop fields and um, the, bare, the bare poles there that, that you can actually see. So it's one of his botanical neo-romantic landscapes. He did a number of these in the 1950s, so he later became a much more abstract paper painter. But here you can see those hot, those hot poles, the way they rise up, they're rather like spears embedded in the ground, as if they're ready to do battle with some unseen enemy. And that low perspective that he adopts renders that um, spiky dandelion leaf you can see almost gargantuan. And I was writing about this during lockdown, and I was out on one of the sort of walks that you were able to do, and seeing some uh, dandelions. And in order to try and get a sense of that perspective, I actually sort of lay down on the ground. And then you can see, so I'm, I'm not advising that you need to go and lie down to actually look and see one, but it did give me a sense of the presence of that and just how he's managed to create that sort of spiky, ghost-like, um, dominant presence there, reaching out into that bleak November uh, night, really. But his muted palette adds to that eerie intensity as well. And the simplified forms are, are very effective. And the sky is undoubtedly, it's foreboding. And in the next slide that I'm, I'm going to show you, that's just painted uh, this next one is by Brian Winter, and it's foreshore with gulls. This is painted down in Cornwall. And Brian Winter was, uh, he was slave trained, he was a conscientious objector, but he was able to come to Cornwall uh, towards the end of the war in June. But he was particularly interested in natural history, and from a child he was always drawing animals and particularly birds. And so when he came to Cornwall, he made a large number of small landscapes. And he, many of these actually included gulls. And he had a, a remote cottage in Penwith that he lived in. And he was drawn to the strange angular shapes. And it's very hard to actually put a sort of a label on this work because it's got elements of sort of cubism, but also it's done in a sort of neo-romantic vein. And, and you can see that hooded gull 
there perching on the anchor as if it's watching everything with its beady eye and yet perhaps it's ready to pounce. So it's, there's a, a dark melodrama to it and we wait and we wonder what that predatory girl might be uh, about to do. So the next work is perhaps um, by an artist, Richard Urich, who will be well known to, to many of you because St. Barb um, has done a number of exhibitions that are featured work by Richard Urich. Richard Urich, when he painted this work in, in 1969, he was living in, in Dibden Purlieu. He'd been living there since 1934, but this was a trip to Wales. Um, he painted this atmospheric Welsh landscape. It, it's full of, again, latent drama. You can see how that the farmhouse or whatever this large building is, the way that it's lit. And he was fascinated by light. And he was a real master of painting and capturing the light. He was a great fan of, of Turner and learnt much from studying his work. And there's a feeling in the painting that there's something about to happen. We don't know what that is, whether a storm is going to break, but it's all there within the painting. And there's a haunting intensity to that landscape. And he'd been deeply moved by the elements as a young child when he used to visit his cousins and he would walk along Chesil Beach and it was the way that the weather changed. It continued to be something to interest him. And of course he was perhaps better known for his, the paintings that he did of the sea and particularly of, of Lee Beach that many of you will, will know, which is near to where he lived. So the last painting that I'm going to talk about before I hand uh, back to Steve is another work by Graham Sutherland. And I think, again, you, you can recognise the style now and, and the drama within his work. And this is another of the wild and dramatic landscape of West Pembrokeshire, which he was drawn to. He'd first visited it in 1934, and he also returned there as, as a war artist. But he was fascinated by the strangeness of the landscape. And he too was captivated by the light. And I think, again, it's another good example of um, that ability to show how the light can transform a, a landscape. But he was also preoccupied with darkness. And again, he employs it to effect here. So that it appears blood red. And it contributes to this feeling of, of some kind of imminent violence, of disaster. And it shows, I think, again, his ability to take the essence from a place and to then to translate it and transform it. And here he does that into this twisted, tormented presence that rises up. And I'll pass to Steve. And I'll give you it. Right, last couple of slides and then we're, we're all done. Um, I mentioned earlier that sunlight, you know, we often think sunlight makes things better. This is a painting by Algernon Newton. Newton is known for his scenes of North London, usually deserted street scenes, um, but also his rural landscapes tend to be unpopular. And despite the sunlight that's common to almost all of them, there's little warmth in his paintings. Andrew Graham Dixon has suggested that Newton was traumatised by wartime experiences um, serving in the army in the First World War, and that the emptiness in his landscapes reflects that lost generation. This is called uh, A Gleam of Sunlight. It was painted in 1966. And what we have is a view to a distant field. You can see a sort of golden cornfield lit in the sunshine. But where the artist is standing and where we as the viewer are standing, we're in deep shade. And the entrance to that valley beyond is, seems to be um, guarded by these two very dark and unnaturally dense trees. Are they kind of barring the way? Is the, is the artist, is the viewer, are we trapped in the shadows, trapped in the shade, unable to move forwards into the sunshine? And our very last picture 
uh, is by Kurt Jackson. This was painted in 2006 and it's called Joyce's Pool. Um, over the years, Kurt has worked on a number of river projects where he's followed uh, various rivers in the country from their source to the sea. And this one shows Joyce's Pool, which is actually the, the fountainhead, the source of the Bristol Avon. Now, places like this, uh, are often celebrated, revered, even been worshipped in times gone by. Um, but the way that Kurt Jackson has portrayed it in this one, it sort of really seems to be shrouded in mystery. It's unsettling and ambiguous. That very dark bank above the water, which reflects the light, really dominates the picture. And you can just see a few tree trunks above. But the fear here, we're moving back to kind of um, absence, if you like. And the absence here is life. And what he was finding in looking into some of these river sources is that um, in, the, in our world of industrialised agriculture, that pesticides and fertilisers and slurry, the runoff from farming is killing these places. They are now devoid of life. There's nothing in them and they're killing our rivers too. So for a contemporary artist looking into the eerie landscapes, the, the climate crisis and the pressures on the natural world provide a chilling context for a modern sense of eeriness in the English countryside. So the Eyrie is alive and well in the 21st century with a new set of anxieties for us to be unsettled by. And if the Eyrie thrives in troubled times, then certainly this seems like a good time to be um, putting on an exhibition on the topic. We hope you've enjoyed the talk this evening. As Jill mentioned, this is just a, a smattering of what's actually in the show. So if you haven't been to see it yet, do please go and have a look. And of course, these reproductions don't do any of the pictures justice. So go and see them in the flesh. And as Prue mentioned right at the beginning, there is a rather lovely catalogue sponsored very kindly by Stuart Southall, in which all of these pictures are, um, uh, are shown, reproduced, uh, along with marvellous um, captions written by Jill and some of the artists, and a few by me as well. And uh, So thank you very much for listening, and we hope you enjoyed the talk. Thank you. <laughs> I hope you any questions? You might have answered them. That's easy then. That's good. You've answered them all. Excellent. Perfect. Yes. Yes, so well, it's a feature of George Shaw's work is that he paints in Humbrol enamels. Uh, anybody here who's built an, an Airfix kit will remember those tiny little pots of paint. George doesn't use those tiny little pots of paint. He gets some much bigger pots from the manufacturers. But yes, that, that is what he's... It's quite thick and it's quite glossy, but it, it gives this kind of quite, quite a flat surface, which seems to be something that he, he aspires to. I can't think of another artist who paints in Humbrol enamels, actually. It's uh, quite unique. <laughs> it's a good job he paints on board <laughs> usually then. <laughs> Here says the conservator. Yeah. <laughs> people like that. <laughs> Any other questions? Did you immerse yourself in Midsummer Murders as a starting point? <laughs> um, not, not in Midsummer's, Midsummer Murders, but I did read some M.R. James and Algernon Blackwood and Robert Aikman and things like that. So, you know, if you want to get a, um, a sense of eerie landscapes and sort of ghost stories and things like that, then that's a good starting point. And people like Paul Nash were reading Arthur Macken, um, another one of these, these writers of weird stories. So there's definitely an overlap between those, between sort of art and literature. They were all feeding off each other. Um, also, the... Terry Pratchett wrote a marvellous thing about a standing stone which used to hide because it was rather frightened of the witches and it used to arise from its pool with a little bunch of, you know, water weed on the top and look around suspiciously in case they were there. Any other questions? All right. Thank you. Well, you never fail. A delight. <laughs> we love you, dear. Thank you very, very much for, for coming in. We're, we're getting ready for the opening, so Steve referred to um, Erie as 
season's evil twin, which I think sums it up beautifully. It's a stunning exhibition. We all keep plugging it, but it is, I mean, it, it, I just can't even begin to think of the amount of work that's gone into it. And um, it's on till Christmas, so go and, go and have a, you can see it half a dozen times and you'll still see different things with it. Quick parish notices. Um, I'll plug the exhibition. It's also the time of year when you divide up all your perennials and start looking at things in your garden and taking cuttings. We're doing open gardens next year. Plenty of time to think about it. It's the end of May. If you'd like to help or anything like that, then there's something in the, in the next newsletter that's going around. And we'd love to hear from you. If you'd like to open your garden, we'd love to hear from you even more. Um, the, the museum's making up for lost time. We've got Tea and Memories on the 18th of October, which is all about sort of water sports, so the regattas, yachting and things. There's also a special dementia session on the 20th. So there's a Tea and Memories for people with dementia. So if you know anybody that that's relevant to, it's free, just come to the museum. And it's been specially devised for them. Barry Fuller is revisiting his landscape history series. There's details on our website about that. That's also starting in October. And we've got so many half-term activities, you wouldn't know what to do. So bring your grandchildren <laughs> and everybody else you can think of. So thank you thank once you. again. Pleasure. You're brilliant as ever. We love you. And very kind. We'll you <laughs> I think they must be talking about you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>